So let's just start where, where cycling began for you. And <laughs> is it a traditional sort of starting point or can you just tell us a bit about the story? Yeah, I mean, no. Uh, <laughs> No, I mean, I, I, I have no background in cycling. I mean, I do now, weirdly, but when I started, I had no background in cycling. In 2003, I was sent uh, to watch the first bike race I'd ever seen, you know, ever been to, and it just happened to be the Tour de France. And I happened to be working for the television, for ITV back then. Seems a long time ago now, um, but it was completely bewildering. I didn't know what was happening from start to finish. All I knew was that David Miller was supposed to win the prologue of that year's race and he managed to make a mess of it by dropping his chain. Do you think in those 16 years your, your knowledge of the sport, how, how has that changed and how has yeah. the sport changed in that time? Well, uh, let's I mean they're two separate things, but I mean the, the, the 2003 Tour de France was completely bewildering from start to finish. I, I did know instantly that there was something remarkable there, something absolutely fascinating, like a code that I wanted to crack and get involved in. I mean, it definitely drew me in. It's just that I didn't know what, I, I just couldn't, I, it, I, there was so much to it. You know, I was still grappling with the whole issue of, if that sprinter's so fast and wins every stage, why doesn't he win the Tour de France? I couldn't get my head around that. I, the basic grammar of the race, I think for people who understand the Tour de France, you have to think yourself back into that position of an outsider because everyone at some point in their life has to go on that journey of kind of like, what? So probably 2003, four, five, which were the last of the three Lance Armstrong years, interestingly enough, um, were, they were my initiation in the sport. Um, and I would say probably for the first three or four years of covering the Tour de France, I really, I really had a very, very loose grip on the, what was actually happening in the race. And it took a long time, a long time. But it wasn't until I think um, pr probably as recently as the last three or four years when I started, I moved from presenting and, and reporting on cycling to actually commentating on the race uh, that I think for the first time I actually started watching a race properly um, by which I mean watching it as a commentator watching it uh, alongside someone as as acute as David Miller and insightful as David Miller. Second part of your question um, how has the Tour de France changed in all those years in 16 years? It's funny because if you look back at footage of 2003 already it seems like a yesteryear it seems like it's kind of racing from a bygone age you know in those days the final climb they didn't even have to wear helmets so you just kind of saw the riders eyes and their faces and you know you could pick them out they seem to have a great deal of character not all of it good it has to be admitted but they had real character back then so the changes that occur on the race occur in such small increments over such a long period of time that at the time you can't see them happening it's only when you stack up a passage of time and you look back you think blimey that's almost like another race but it has been through over those years a seismic shift in many ways in terms of its culture it's been turned on its head it's gone from a French speaking activity where most of the peloton when I started out couldn't speak English to a peloton whose mother tongue is English you know even the French riders and the Spanish riders and the Basque riders now speak English that's remarkable so it's kind of globalized in that sense for better or worse and it has gone by and large from being a pretty corrupt and doping ridden peloton back then to something that is much, much more credible as a sporting spectacle. Um, it, I hesitate to say it's completely clean because that would be a naive thing to suggest. But those riders who are doping or taking a risk with the, the credibility of the sport are in the extreme minority now. Would there be a key moment in those 16 years, maybe a race, maybe a personality which it just sticks in your mind. Yeah, yeah. in terms of the riders who, who have made an impact in, in my time on the race, um, Armstrong's contribution is complex because of what happened to him afterwards and subsequently uh, w w was revealed to have, have, have been a kind of an industrialised doper on a scale that the race had never seen before. And yet, and yet you have to credit those years. The cold hard facts suggest that the Armstrong myth, and it was a myth, um, exploded the race onto a global stage in a way that nothing prior to that had ever done before. So they're not insignificant. Then there were a number of years where the race was in chaos. You know, there were, there were races that almost fell apart before they got underway, like in 2006, there were winners um, like Floyd Landis that year who was subsequently stripped of a title. There was the Contador um, uh, case, the Clen Buterol case. There were more or less credible winners and everyone was looking for kind of a way forward and I think probably the birth of Team Sky and everything that they've subsequently gone on to do shifted that debate one step further on and created, if you like, the beginnings of modern cycling the way we see it. And again, I, hesitate, I stress, for better or worse, because it's not to everyone's taste. 
Individual riders who've made an impact, though, uh, from my perspective, undeniably a key moment was uh, 2008, stage four, stage five, something like that, Chateau Roux, when Cavendish, having been on the race the year before and stepped off after seven or eight stages without a win, suddenly started winning. That was his first stage win. And that was something I think from a British perspective I had never imagined was possible. I couldn't conceive of a British rider winning a regular stage of the Tour de France, let alone then going on to win another 29 in quick succession. So his contribution, albeit as a sprinter and not as a GC racer, often gets overlooked and overshadowed by everything that Wiggins and Froome and Thomas now have gone on to achieve. But he shouldn't be overshadowed. He is one of the greatest racers ever to have um, taken part in the Tour de France. The challenges of commentating live. Yeah, yeah. You must have had some stories, especially when, when you were out in, in the mountains. How does that work? And I guess you have to be quite adaptable. Yeah, I mean, uh, people who, who uh, quite understandably perhaps haven't stopped and thought, well, how does it actually work? How do you commentate on, on the Tour de France? Some people think that you're actually on a, on a motorbike by the side of the race or somehow in a car in the middle of the race. You're not. You're sitting in a darkened room at the finish line in a truck, um, often with rain battering down on the roof because you're at the top of some godforsaken mountain like the Tourmalet, um, or uh, you, you've got the air condition cranked up to hot, you know, the, the, the absolute maximum because you're in the baking heat of the south of France, but you're still in a darkened room, essentially watching telly like everybody else is watching telly, only you're the mug who has to call the shots and you're there to be shot at by everyone else who's just idly just sifting through Twitter and is potentially much better informed than you are because you're in the moment. It's the job of the commentator to kind of impart some of the emotion of the race. It's really weird watching a bike race without commentary. If you've ever done that, I don't know, because you kind of need, even if the commentator is talking a load of rubbish, like we often do, you kind of need that guiding narrative just to sort of accompany you through the process. And then to feed in that key, those key bits of information that make sense of the story. Just recently, the Tour de France has taken the, the kind of, just over the last couple of years, the, the very significant step of showing the entire race. But I think it's just modernity, and I think it was an inevitability that we would one day get entire coverage of the Tour de France. And actually, if you think back now, and you think, well, I, sometimes the first four hours of racing weren't even recorded. No one actually knew what happened. That's a bit mad, isn't it, for a global sporting event? Like, if you consider Wimbledon or the World Cup, it's not like you just don't show the knockout rounds and you just come in, we join, we join the World Cup at the semi-final stage, you know. It would make no sense, so it was always going to happen that we'd see the whole race. You have to know a lot about 12th century French architecture. That was actually one of my <laughs> It was, um, how do you go about researching these, these landmarks? Is it, uh, is it a case of three weeks on Wikipedia? Yeah. Wikipedia plays its role, I won't deny that, because um, often things will pop up on the screen that you weren't expecting, right, boom, and they'll have a little caption and it's the Basilica of St. Mary of something or other and you, I, you don't know what it, you know, we're not pulling the wool over anyone's eyes here, you know, everyone knows that we are trying to do the research on the hoof. It is a hugely significant part of the Tour de France in particular and the reason that a lot of people tune in simply to celebrate France, you know, the, the topography, the geography and the history of the country. Working with David, how does the relationship work? I mean well, in our various different guises, he is a racer, me and a as a reporter, we've known each other for a long time. But we both came to commentating, which is an entirely different thing for both of us, uh, fresh, in other words, together. I'd never commentated before, and David had obviously never commentated before he'd been racing. If you like, we formed a team from the same starting point, like how are we going to make this work? Because neither of us had done this job before. So we had a blank slate, really. Obviously within that, it's, it's very simple. Commentating, I think, quite often works best if there is an outsider and an insider. You know, someone who shares that, that, that uh, insider's wisdom and someone who, from the outsider's perspective, uh, helps the viewer with a helping hand and just says, well, let, let me talk you through, let's guide. I tell the story, David provides the detail. I think there are very few commentators on any sport, and especially cycling, who have made the impact that David Miller has made as, a, as an expert analyst uh, in a shorter space of time. Indeed. Good stuff. Well, thank you very much. Nick. Pleasure. That was great. Really All right, cool. Do you want Mr. Miller? In